If you've been uh, listening, uh, in my previous uh, sermons, I've tried to uh, 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 preach a, a series on the topic, of, uh, the topic of grace and what grace has produced uh, in us. It didn't sound like a series because usually a series you do one Sunday after another and I get to preach every other time. So, uh, but believe me, I have been preaching uh, several sermons on the, uh, on the subject of grace. So uh, in the previous lessons, uh, just to remind you, uh, I've talked about grace, this idea of grace and what grace produced in us. And I said, first of all, it produces graciousness uh, in us. In other words, a change in our attitude to reflect God's mercy uh, and love. We talked about that in the, in the songs. That's one thing when we see and experience God's grace, it has an effect on us. Another thing that grace uh, produces in us is gratitude. I preached a whole sermon on that. The greater our realization of sin, the greater our appreciation and gratitude for God's grace. And this gratitude eventually is expressed as heartfelt appreciation or dependence on the source of that grace, which is God. And also uh, we have a sense of peace and a sense of well-being. Why do we have that? Because we have money or because we have fame or because we have, I don't know, a big house or we have I, whatever, we're strong physically. Is that why we have a sense of peace? Of course not, because those things can just wither away in a day. One day you're well and the next day you're not well, right? No, it, it's the grace of God that gives us a sense of, of peace and, and, and assurance. And then uh, we also talked about the aroma of Christ. A gracious heart and attitude begins to be seen and felt by others as uh, they see us being led by Christ. There's something about us that's, that's different, that's just not worldly. You know, you have people say, I don't know about that couple, but uh, you know, we've interacted with, there's just something, I can't put my finger on it, they say. But the finger that they'd like to put on is, those people are full of God's grace. And it shows in their, in their speech and in their attitude uh, about various things. Well, I want to add one more thing uh, in today's lesson. Grace also produces a certain maturity or growth uh, as Christians in us. And so today I want to discuss some of the things that we learn because of grace. Some of the things that we learn because of God's grace and our experience. For example, grace teaches us to value the church. Grace teaches us to value the church. This is why, uh, uh, this is only a, a personal observation, but in my experience, I have noticed that the people who misunderstand or undervalue God's grace in their own lives also do not place a very high value on the church as well. For example, those who are self-reliant, those who are not in touch with their own sinfulness rarely see their need for the church, rarely see the need for church life. I'm good, you know, I'm fine. What did I ever do to anybody? I'm okay with the big guy upstairs. I never killed anybody. I never stole from any, you know, they, they're fine, they're okay. They don't see their own sinfulness. And if we don't see our own sinfulness, we don't have a lot of need for the church. The final result of grace, if you think about it for a moment, is the church. God's grace worked through Jesus Christ to ultimately produce what? Well, to produce the church, the ultimate valuable thing that's in this world. Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 28, uh, that uh, Emil uh, read a few moments ago. Christ, who is grace personified, said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18, 
the church built by Christ, the church built by grace. You know, Jesus didn't uh, build our church. He didn't build the church. He didn't build a church. He built his church, it belongs to him. The church is valuable because it is his church and also because it is where our works of grace and our experience of grace, uh, these things are carried out. I would not have known grace from watching National Geographic TV. I would not have known grace had I read all the philosophers in the last 200 years. I would not have known about grace if I would have followed all the movies made in Hollywood and all the movies made in Europe and watched every single one of them. None of those things would have taught me about God's grace. Only the preaching of the gospel, usually done in a church or among the church or by the church, only the preaching of the gospel teaches me about grace. And the more I understand the depth and the width and the meaning of God's grace, the more I appreciate and I value what grace's ultimate goal was. And what was grace's ultimate goal? The church. You know, I, 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 I could, I was going to say pull my hair out, but that would get a laugh. Uh, very, uh, you know, I'm very frustrated when I hear people say, and, and I have to say, usually younger people, they say, I don't need the church. I don't need the church. Uh, me and God, we're good. I used to know a lady who, who liked to play golf and, and, that was, and she was a member of the church for a time. And she would say, well, you know, she, you know, Sunday mornings, if Sunday mornings were nice, she'd be out in the golf course. And, and I wasn't afraid to confront her on it. I mean, you know, she was a member, this was back in Canada. And I said, hey, you know, I, I don't see you in the Lord's day. What's going on? I'm playing golf. I said, don't you play golf on Saturday or Thursday? Yeah, but it's nice on Sunday. There are less people, so on and so forth. And anyways, she would say, I'm out there with God. Me and God are together. I, I, well, she didn't say it in words, but what she said was, I don't need the church. <laughs> I don't need the church. Someone who says they don't need the church really doesn't understand about God's grace because God's grace produced the church. You know, uh, Bobby eloquently spoke about the blood of Jesus. What do you think the blood of Jesus produced? It produced us and people like us that meet throughout the world. Christ is the embodiment of grace. The church is the experience of grace in the lost world. You, you want to experience God's grace in this lost world? Live out your life in the church. Serve the church, give to the church, sacrifice for the church, forgive those who offend you in the church. Teach somebody in the church. Go to a dying brother or sister's home and hold their hand and pray with them. And you'll learn about the grace of God. The only place where you'll learn about the grace of God. Secondly, grace teaches me how to please God. In the last words of his last epistle, the apostle Peter, and you know what we say about Peter, he's the been there, done that. He, if any apostle could say been there, done that, Peter could say been there, done that, that Peter, he finishes with one last summary exhortation that says it all. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says, but, and he says, to who? To the church now. He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And so in his final words, he's an apostle of the church. 
and he's speaking to the church and he's given his final words to the church. Look what he says and look what he doesn't say. First of all, what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, so remember now, do more, work longer, try harder. He didn't say that, I mean, he had a chance. He didn't say that, why? Because output creates religious pride, that's why, when we only focus on that. Activity in the absence of grace causes one to compare oneself to others. Activity alone is never satisfying because there is always more that you can do. The person I feel sorry for in the world is the one who's a perfectionist but does not know Christ. Oh, that person I really feel badly for. Because they're never satisfied and it's never good enough. And they can never ever please themselves or please someone else because they're perfectionists. They always see what could be better, but they have no sense of grace. Oh, I don't want that life. I feel sorry for that person. What else does he doesn't say? Well, he doesn't say, now make sure you focus on yourself. <laughs> you know, searching for the real you, the inner self, getting it together, searching for self without Jesus Christ is futile. Why? Because all you're going to find if you search for yourself without Christ is an imperfect human being, that's it. You want to find who you really are? Go to Europe, go to China, you know, walk across Europe, do whatever you want to find out who you are without Christ. You're going to find out who you are. You're imperfect. <laughs> You're imperfect. And he doesn't say judge yourself either. Judging includes measurement. To what do we measure ourselves? And what would be good enough to pass the measurement? There can be no perfect 10 score, no knowledge is perfect, no repentance is perfect. It's always in part. To judge oneself is to find oneself guilty. Where do you go from there? Now, what does he say? He says, grow in grace itself. The knowledge and the experience of God's grace, grow in that. In other words, realize and understand how much God loves us. If there's one mistake that we make as Christians, and I'm generalizing here, it's that we usually underestimate God's love. In my experience in, in, in counseling fellow Christians who are having spiritual difficulties, rarely, rarely is it that the problem is the person has overestimated God's love. Very rarely is that the problem. The problem is we underestimate his love. We say things like, how could God forgive me for that? How could God be patient enough for me when I've once again done the thing I swore I would never do? Why would God bless me if I continue to fail in the area where I so badly want to succeed spiritually? Why would he bless me? We need to see the power of God's grace. I've told you this uh, before uh, about you know, gravestones and everything. <laughs> when I was much younger, it was something I'd say, one of these days I'm going to get a gravestone and, and this is what I'm going to put on it. Well, you know, I already bought the, the burial plot <laughs> and buying the gravestone is, 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 you know, is coming much closer than it used to. But my idea is the same on the gravestone. I want to put Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I 
I mean? If that's the last thing you think of before you go out of this world, that was a good thought. Peter says, grow in that. Understand that idea that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Grow strong in that. Dwell on these things, rejoice in it, rely on it, share the wonderful news of grace with other people. Live like a person who is in the power of God's grace. Don't be afraid. And don't be afraid to be joyful. Don't be afraid to be confident in death. Don't be afraid of anyone or anything and don't allow anyone to take that knowledge and that confidence away from you. And then he says, grow in the knowledge of grace itself. Not just grow in grace, grow in the knowledge of grace. People are hungry for the power of God's grace in their lives and, and we need to be able to teach others about this gift. You know, when we talk about, we need to evangelize, we need to share the faith, you know, and, and inside usually there's a collective, oh dear, oh, here we go, you know, evangelize, I got to talk to somebody about Jesus, you know. It's not about talking to somebody about Jesus, it's about lifting the burden of guilt off of somebody's shoulder and giving them hope. Why? Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you talk to somebody long enough and honestly enough, they will eventually get around to the idea that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a good person. How many people have I talked to who've said, you know, there's no point in me coming to church because God has given up on me a long time ago. I, I'm too bad. I'm gay. I'm a thief. I did time in jail. I killed somebody. I left my wife. I abandoned my children. How could God love me? We've got good news for those people. It's not just the one, two, do, one, two, three, be baptized, of course, do that. It's the idea, but friend, but daughter, but son, there's no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And they'll say, how can that possibly be? <laughs> I couldn't forgive somebody who did the stuff that I did. Yeah, but you don't know my Jesus. You don't know God. You don't know grace. Let me, let me tell you about that. That's preaching the gospel. Grow in the ability to administer the gospel of grace, not the gospel of law. And he says, grow in the knowledge of Christ himself. Do not merely grow in the knowledge, but grow in the dependence on Christ. You know, when we say, I know Jesus, that's not just some, I know all the doctrines. I know Jesus means I depend on Jesus. It's the opposite of what we strive for in the world. In the world, what we strive for is to be independent. I don't need anybody. I want to have enough money so that I don't have to depend on anybody. But in Christ, it's the complete opposite. The more mature I become in Christ, the more I depend on him, the less I depend on me. Many people know about Jesus, they know about the doctrine of grace, but real growth takes place when we begin to rely on the Lord and his grace more and more, and not just know the doctrines and the facts about Jesus, but to actually know Him. Believe me, I'm learning this myself as I grow older and I am less needed and I can do less. Depending on Him is not only a lesson point in one of my sermons, it's becoming a daily reality for me. 
His grace is steady, even if my service is declining, even if my strength and my ability is going down. His grace remains always steady, always there. Grace teaches us to please God by depending, uh, 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 by deepening rather, our appreciation for His grace in our lives and sharing with others and enabling us to draw closer into a more personal relationship with Him. God wants a sincere relationship with someone who appreciates Him and depends on Him, not a slave who's afraid of Him. And knowing God's grace helps us to do that. Very quickly moving on, grace teaches us to suffer. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus answers Paul concerning his suffering, uh, the thorn in his flesh, right? And he says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. We know Paul, don't we? Paul was a man of action, a man of results. When he opposed Christ, he wanted to destroy every Christian on the earth. When he became a Christian, he wanted every soul on the earth to be so saved in Christ. That's the type of guy he was. He was all in. Here and many other times in his ministry, he was delayed, he was defeated, he was weakened, he was opposed and had his desired results watered down or totally denied. He wanted to go west, God wanted him to go east. God during this time provided the grace for Paul to enable him to suffer these setbacks and trials without losing faith or hope or love. Grace doesn't mean you don't suffer. Grace doesn't mean everything goes the way you want it to go. That's not grace. Grace is what helps you get through stuff when the roof caves in when the rug gets pulled out, when you get abandoned. So that's what grace does. It enables us to suffer without losing our faith, our hope, our love. The unbelievers, they can suffer stoically, but they can't suffer maintaining faith, hope, and love. Only grace does this. In addition to teaching and enabling him to suffer, God also taught Paul that in the end, grace would be enough for him to please and come to God. I please God because I depend on his grace to save me. Not because I've done this or that or whatever, Bible talk, that's all good, that's, that's gratitude on my part. Grace is enough to get you in. Do you see what I'm saying? It's grace that gets you in. It's difficult for a proud and active and task-oriented guy like Paul to accept. It's hard for any works-oriented person to accept that grace is enough. But to those who seek to grow in grace, God will teach them this deep lesson. And it is a deep lesson. Number four, grace teaches us our Christian duty. As we study the epistles, you see that there's a kind of a flow of information in them. Take the epistle of uh, Romans, for example. There's doctrine, then there's duty. In other words, in chapters one to 11, uh, Paul explains the doctrine of universal sin, the doctrine of salvation by faith, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of Jewish election. All of that is taught in uh, chapters one to 11, but then in 12 to 16, you have the Christian duty in church and society. The so what do I do with all of this doctrine? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 teaches the reader what they need to be doing. Uh, Paul summarizes this concept in 2 Timothy. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. 
And so grace comes in the form of Christ offering salvation and justification by faith and reliance on Jesus expressed in repentance and baptism, yes. This is the revelation, this is the doctrine, this is the gospel, this is the announcement, this is the good news. But notice, however, that grace goes on to teach us our duty, our responsibility as Christians. If we uh, were saved by the power of grace, but that power could not enable us to live righteous lives, what good would it be? We would simply be cursed to return to the sinful and lost state that we once were. However, grace enables us to live righteously and provides us the information that we need to live that righteous life. In other words, grace enables us to deny ungodliness. Grace enables us to deny worldly lusts. Grace enables us to live soberly and righteously and godly. Grace not only instructs us to live this way, but it also provides us with the ability to do so. When I was saved, I so badly wanted to do what God wanted me to do. Isn't that the point? I want to do what, have you never prayed that? God, just tell me what to do. Just, do I go right or do I go left? Just tell me, I'm, I'm ready to do it, but I just, you know, is it right or left? Do I take the job or do I not take the job? Do I marry this girl or do I not marry this? You know, just show me. And because we're like that, grace teaches us to obey. Because I want to, but I don't always know how. Jesus himself says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You say you love Jesus, do you obey him? Jesus said that if his uh, disciples would obey him, how, 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 could they, how could this be so? No one has ever been able to obey God, but grace teaches us to obey God. Someone will say, how does it do that? First of all, it provides us an example of love. John 3, 16. My obedience is motivated not by fear or self-interest, but by a love so great that it overcomes my resistance. In other words, I'm tempted to do a thing and my, my conscience, which is influenced by grace, says to me, how could you, the person that God loves, the person that loves God, how could you do that? Grace also provides the Holy Spirit. As a true child of God attested by the Holy Spirit within me, I am, now, I am now calling on my true father who has adopted me in Christ. When I say, God, please help me do this right thing. Please help me resist it. I'm not just you know, talking to the air. I'm talking to the true and living God. And I am now able to obey because I am now in the family of God with the indwelling of the spirit as proof of my sonship. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me in Acts 2.38, the one who repents and believes in Jesus and who is baptized, his sins are forgiven and he or she receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how I know. I don't need a sign in the sky. I don't need the cloud formation to form a cross over my house. I don't need for my heart to beat faster. I don't need to see a vision. I just have to open my Bible and, and look at Acts 2.38 and remember November, the, the day in November 1977 when I said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and Jim Metter immersed me in the waters of baptism. That's it, I just put those two together. It's all I need. 
And thirdly, grace teaches me by providing the will of the Father. Now I know the will of the Lord and what and where he directs me. I'm not blind as the, uh, as the song says, I do see. Some don't like the mixing of the two ideas, you know, grace and obedience, because they confuse obedience with the idea of works. Works is the effort to please God by giving him something, good deeds. Obedience is the effort to please God because of what he has given to us. The big difference. Grace teaches me how to respond to the free and priceless gift of salvation God has given me in Christ Jesus. For those who truly want and need and understand this gift, it is natural to want to obey with all their heart. It's easy to see Christianity as an endless round of meetings and duties and don't do this and don't do that. Because much of our experience of the Christian religion is tied up in public services and private acts of service or meetings, church matters. This is necessary in a congregation our size and living in the society that we do. But let's remember, however, to let the grace of God, which initially drew us to Christ, also teach us about the God that we love and serve and want to be with in the end. Therefore, grace teaches us to love and care for the precious body of Christ the church. Grace teaches us to make pleasing God in our everyday lives a priority. Grace teaches us to bear patiently under our various trials and sufferings with success. Grace teaches us what we need to do and what we need to eliminate in our lives in order to please God. And grace teaches us to have our, an obedient attitude, which is truly the mark of Jesus Christ. If we allow grace to teach us these things, we will find great satisfaction in our spiritual lives, despite the hectic pace we are faced to live with in this present world. Brothers and sisters, Christ, excuse me, grace rather, leads us to Christ and these types of blessings. However, and I'll say it once again, only faith expressed in repentance and baptism puts us into Christ where these blessings are found, where grace is found. As Paul says in Galatians chapter three, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You may know Christ, but unless you've been buried with him in baptism, you don't have access to his grace and all it can both produce in you and teach in you. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends, visitors, stop putting it off any longer. Let this be the day that you respond to the gospel if you need to, or perhaps return to the Lord if you have sinned, or if you have been unfaithful, or if you have rejected the grace that he so lovingly offers to every one of us. If you need to make a response this morning in any way, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs>